All right, let me invite you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, if you would, this evening, please. 2 Peter 1, we're going to jump right into God's Word, right where we left off this morning, as we look at this theme of knowing Christ and growing in Christ. Thank you for being here tonight. I am really looking forward to our time, not only together tonight, but also the rest of the week. Look, we know life is busy and there's a lot on you, but let me just encourage you to understand that pastor doesn't in a sadistic way, plan these things to try to make your crazy life even crazier, okay? He's not trying to add things to test your faithfulness. It's because of the value and the importance of our walk with Christ and our spiritual life that they're setting aside time for the purpose of God's Word. Let me just encourage you with that. It's, it, it is, your walk with God is worth it. And I want to really challenge you as you can to be faithful this week and to come expecting God to give you something. When we come expectantly with a a heart of desire for God to give us, he always will. And God will use his word in your heart this week. Let's let him do that even tonight. We're going to look tonight, verse number three, as we look at this theme, uh, we're going to see tonight the sufficiency of Christ. Would you look with me please at 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. God's word says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Look this way for a moment, please. Have you ever kind of, maybe kind of bought it a little bit into the, this fallacious idea of, boy, man, it, I, I, there's something lacking. I, I need a little something to kind of accentuate or supplement in my Christian life. So, and I mentioned a little bit this morning, but there's all these spiritual secrets coming out. You ever go to a Christian bookstore and you start seeing all these different new spiritual secrets and the answers to all these things. And so they, they've kind of, hey, this is the answer to peace or joy or answered prayer or some other area of your spiritual life. Here's this uncovered secret. Can I tell you something? It's all scam, right? really is. As if there's something that God has hidden from us that he may or may not give to a select few. Uh, and so we're not really sure if you're going to get it or not. And he might reveal the secret to somebody. And after thousands of years, he's finally decided to... Just, you know, reveal it to so-and-so so he can write a book. We are looking too many times in the wrong place for our needs to be met. And here's, here's the answer. Here's what he's saying. Christ is our source of sufficiency. Christ is sufficient. And he lays it out in just very plain terms because in the, in the Christian life, for an, our lives to be living out our faith, an authentic Christianity, an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, all I need is Christ. All I have is Christ. Let's remember Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life. Christ is enough. And so, Look, you say, well, if I, just, if I just need something, I need an answer for my marriage or my, or my home or for this or for that or for happiness or for final joy or peace, I need looking. Can I tell you something? The answer always goes back to the, the answer is always back to Christ. And here's what he says. Three things tonight. Three things. Number one, everything we need has, number one, been given to us by his divine person. Look what he says. I want you to see verse three. According as his divine Who is he speaking about? That reflects back to the end of verse 2, our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's referring back to the divinity of Jesus Christ, his divine. He's referring to a divine person. Everything that we need has been given to us by the divine person of God, which means this. If God is the creator of all of our needs, and he is, then he alone is the meter of all of the needs that he has created for us. And so we need to be looking to him to realize, hey, everything I need, I find in Jesus Christ. He is the source of sufficiency for the believer. He is the, he is the immutable, the unchanging, eternal, all-powerful source and supply of everything that we need in our Christian life. Everything we need has been given to us by his divine person. John 15 gives us an, a picture of our relationship with Christ. He makes an analogy. John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. 
My father is the husband. By the way, true vine refers to the fact that he's the source and sustainer of life. He just got done saying in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. So he's, he's using a physical example to drive home a spiritual point. He says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. And then he gives us an analogy. I am the vine. You are the branches. Every branch of me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. Then may bring forth more fruit. He now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Then he goes on to say this. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, neither can ye except ye abide me for without me you can do nothing what he's saying is this Jesus Christ he is the source and sustainer for the believer we're the branch when he, and the life of Christ in us his desire is for fruit to come fruit is the outward evidence of life that's all it is but that fruit is not possible unless we are abiding in the vine. Christ is our source. That's what we're looking to. So, for example, we know that an apple tree is an apple tree because hanging in the branches there are. Wow, you guys really did not get your afternoon nap. Okay, try that. Okay, you know that an orange tree is an orange tree because hanging on the end of the branches there are. Very good. You know that a pineapple tree is a pineapple tree because. Yeah. All right. Pineapples don't grow on trees, for those of you who are wondering why are people laughing. Just testing to see if you're awake. Fruit is the evidence of life. And so the fruit of good works and the fruit of the Spirit is to be evident in the life of the believer. Galatians 5, this I, the walk, this I say, the walk in the Spirit, and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the, the, the fruits of the Spirit are... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The fruits of the Spirit and the fruit of good works, our life producing, demonstrating outwardly the reality and the, of our, and the authenticity of our relationship with Christ. God is the source of that. And it's been given to us. It's all been provided for us by his divine person. Number two, it's been given through his divine power. Look what he says. According as his divine power power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The word here translated power is the Greek word dunamis, where we get the English word dynamite. It speaks of inherent power, but it also speaks of the capability of giving power. God is not only our strength. He is the one who is capable of giving his strength to us. And that's grace, by the way. His divine power working in and through us and for us, but we're not capable of in of ourselves. And it's been given to us by his divine power. We need, look, you and I need to be reminded of the truth and the reality that our God has not changed. He's still all powerful. Revelation says, for the Lord God omnipotent, all powerful, reigneth, is reigning. Psalm 62, 11, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Psalm 115, 3, but our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Luke 137, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. God's power has given to us, if you look with me, please, back at the text, he says, according as his divine power hath given. Look this way. Not trying to be super technical, but this is really important to know. The phrase hath given, the tense there in the Greek language is this. It's something that has already been done, and the results from that are ongoing. So God's already given it to us. It's already been provided. He's not, look, he's not withholding things in heaven. He's not gonna, he's not gonna to give out some secret spiritual superpower pill for you. Every, it's already been done, and it's already been done through the person of Jesus Christ. His divine power has given to us, who is the us, to every person that shares in this like precious faith. So look at me, if you know Christ as your Savior, this has been given to you. You. But I'm only eight, it's been given to you. But I'm 80, it's been given to you doesn't matter. If you are a believer, you share in this faith. It has been given to you through Jesus Christ. His divine power hath given us, he says, all things, everything that pertains to two things. It's already been done. Two things that pertains to life and godliness. Now here we see God's divine purpose. So everything has been given, number one, by his divine power person through his divine power for his divine purpose, which is this. Look back at our text because I want you to get your eyes on this truth. He says, it's been everything that pertains or deals with two things, life and godliness. 
The word life here is referring specifically to eternal life, which simply means this. Everything that was necessary for you who were dead in your trespasses and sins, separated from God and condemned by God by that sin, everything that was necessary for you to have life was accomplished through Jesus Christ. You can't add anything to it. And nothing more remains to be done. When Jesus Christ gave up his life on the cross, he said these words. It is ongoing, huh? Is that what he said? No, he made a declaration. He said, it is finished. Done. Nothing more remains. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. 1 Peter 1.18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just, that's Jesus Christ who never sinned for the unjust, that's you and me who broke his law, that he might bring us unto God. Hebrews 9.27, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood entered he once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Which means when he purchased us, That's a one-time deal. It's done. We are redeemed through the blood of Christ, and the price that he paid for our redemption means that we are sealed for all of eternity. We are forever his because we are bought with his blood. And so he says, look, everything necessary for life and then godliness, which is the idea of God-likeness, Christ-likeness. Now, we're going to deal again with this word because it deals, it comes up later in the text. We're going to deal with that word in a little more detail later, so come back for that night, okay? Um, but God-likeness, God, God-likeness is the idea of a, a loving devotion and loyal dedication to God and a desire to not only please him, but to become more like Christ, Can I just remind you of something? That when God saved you, you were saved with purpose. Remember Romans 8, 29, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to what? Be conformed to the image of his son. God's plan from eternity past is that every person who is saved by grace is to become more like Jesus Christ. He wants to make you more like Christ and less like you. And that needs to be our heart's desire. Lord, I've been been saved for 50 years. You still need to be a little more like Jesus and a little less like you. So do I. Actually, a lot more like Jesus and a lot more less like me, in my case. That's, that's That's what he desires to do in us. That's the idea of godliness. So look, everything you need for that eternal life... And that's secure and that's eternal. The, think of this, the godliness is the living out or the working out of that life. It's his eternal life in us transforms our earthly living for him. Change how we live. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, new creature. Literally new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He wants to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. And so everything we need, his divine purpose to make us like Jesus Christ, he's given it to us. Look at me. You're, you're not going to like this, and it's okay. We're going to deal with it again. This, it, it all comes together, some other pieces, but here's a little hint at it. It, takes, it unravels the excuses that we have woven in our minds to excuse the way that we live our lives as believers. Because what we find is, is the excuses. Have you made, what excuse have you, have you kind of woven in your mind to excuse your life not being like Jesus Christ because of whatever it is you struggle with? You gripe, you're ungrateful, you have a tongue that gossips, you lie, you're proud, you're angry, you have lust problems, you're a thief. Maybe you struggle with just fill in the blank. And you say, well, you know what? I would be more like Christ if this. Nope. You know what? Everything you need to be like your Savior has already been given to you. That's what the text says. And look where it is. Look, look how our text ends. He says this. It's been given. Look with me, please. Back at verse number three. Through the knowledge. There's that key word again. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Here again, that word knowledge is the idea of a real. It is a intimate. It's personal. 
growing understanding of the person of Christ. Again, hang tight. We're going to deal with that at word again in more detail a little bit later. But this is the idea of the word. Everything through the knowledge, look at me please, of him that called us, that have called us to glory and virtue. Now, Look this way for a second, please. This is, uh, for those of you who, you maybe, have, if you've ever done any kind of translation or you've had a talk, I've, I've preached in several foreign countries, there are times when there's, you can legitimately translate one word more than one way. And that's the way it is in the text. And it actually does have a little bit of variant meaning, so I want, I want to lay this out for you, okay? So if you, that word at the end, he's called us to glory and virtue, that word to can also legitimately be translated by. So let me explain how that works. Here's the two meanings. So when he says that he has called us to glory and virtue means that when God saved us, the word calling here is the idea of the purpose, that he has called us to live a life that reflects his glory as he transforms us. And that life is a life called to or a purpose of virtue, which means moral excellence, which refers to the change that comes in the life of a sinner. So let me ask you a question. Is that true? Is the purpose of the believer to bring glory to God, yes or no? Yes. Does God desire to transform us, to make us more like Jesus Christ? Absolutely. And sometimes for those, and depending on uh, your background and the age you were saved, like for example, my grandpa was an alcoholic. My grandpa was a bouncer in a tavern. When God saved him, it was a radical transformation where he stopped drinking and he stopped swearing. It was, there was a life of virtue that came in his life. Okay, so you following me here? Okay, now let's, now let's use the word by. So now he has called us by his glory and virtue. What does that mean? Well, here's the idea is that God called us in drawing us to Christ. It was the glory of Jesus Christ that was revealed when he was lifted up on the cross. And not only in his death, but also in his resurrection, where the glory of God was manifested in the promised Messiah who came, fulfilled all of the law's command, lived a sinless life, and the sinless Son of God publicly displayed on the cross, reflecting the love of God for humanity and providing a once-for-all sacrifice for humanity to be redeemed. And by the resurrection, triumphing over sin and death and crushing it and winning victory. And it's the virtue of Jesus Christ, the sinlessness of Christ. When we see Christ's sinlessness, what does it reveal in us? Our sinfulness. You see, look, if we didn't see our sinfulness, we would never know our need of a Savior. And that's John 3 says, and Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, will do what? I'll draw men on myself. What, what draws us to Christ? It's because he's everything we are not. And he did everything we could not do. So here's the theological question. Which is it? To or by? You, you know what my answer is? Yes, it's both. And I believe that's why God chose that word. It is the glory of Jesus Christ on the cross and his, his perfection his sinlessness that draws him, that draws us to him, and in drawing us to himself in salvation, when we receive him by faith, we have a purpose, and that's to bring him glory and to live a life that manifests a relationship with Christ as he changes us and transforms our life into a life of virtue, excellence, that, that displays Christ's likeness in our lives. Friend, tonight as we, as we conclude our message together, do you realize that Christ is your sufficient one? No, 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 wait a minute. I didn't ask you if you know it. I'm asking, do you realize it? Is it a reality in your life? Are you looking to him as your all-sufficient one? Or do you look at your life and you see needs and you keep looking for outside sources to fill in the needs that only God can provide and what he has already done for you? God's not holding back something from you. Everything you need for eternal life and godliness, living out that life, living life for Christ, has already been given to you through knowing Christ, the one who has called you by and to his glory and virtue. Christ is sufficient for you. And if we're going to live out an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ... 
What we cling to is our Savior. Who we look to is our Savior. Who we trust in is our Savior. And who we depend on is our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know the needs represented here this evening. God does. Can I tell you something? I can stand here on the authority of God's word and tell you without shame and without hesitation that Christ is sufficient to meet every need represented in this room right now. So here's what we're going to do. Like we did this morning, we're going to take some time to do two things. Reflect, think about the truth, let it, let that truth simmer in your mind a little bit. Let it sink down into the soil of your heart and take root and respond to it. Maybe this evening you need to remember that Christ, there's sufficient one, you need to lean on his divine person, who he is. Trust his wisdom, his power, his grace, his mercy in your life. Maybe you need to remember whatever you're facing, it's not greater than God's power to meet it. Maybe the divine purpose that he had, everything that's necessary for life and godliness has already been given to you through knowing Christ, the one who called you to and by his glory and virtue. Would you tonight respond as the Spirit of God has taken that truth and applied it to your heart and come to Christ and lean on your all-sufficient Savior? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed together this evening. Let's reflect and respond to this truth.